Section three of a guide to Stoicism by Saint George William Joseph Stock Ethic Part A We have already had to touch upon the psychology of the Stoics in connection with the first principles of logic. It is no less necessary to do so now in dealing with the foundation of ethic. The Stoics, we are told, reckoned that there were eight parts of the soul. These were the five senses, the organ of sound, the intellect, and the reproductive principle. The passions, it will be observed, are conspicuous by their absence, for the Stoic theory was that the passions were simply the intellect in a diseased state, owing to the perversions of falsehood. This is why the Stoics would not parley with passion conceiving that if once it were let into the citadel of the soul it would supplant the rightful ruler. Passion and reason were not two things which could be kept separate, in which case it might be hoped that reason would control passion, but were two states of the same thing, a worse and a better. The unperturbed intellect was the legitimate monarch in the kingdom of man, hence the Stoics commonly spoke of it as the leading principle. This was the part of the soul which received fantasies, and it was also that in which impulses were generated with which we have now more particularly to do. Impulse or appetition was the principle in the soul which impelled to action. In an unperverted state it was directed only to things in accordance with nature. The negative form of this principle or the avoidance of things as being contrary to nature we shall call repulsion. Notwithstanding the sublime heights to which Stoic morality rose, it was professedly based on self-love, wherein the Stoics were at one with the other schools of thought in the ancient world. The earliest impulse that appeared in a newly born animal was to protect itself and its own constitution which were conciliated to it by nature. What tended to its survival it sought, what tended to its destruction it shunned. Thus self-preservation was the first law of life. While man was still in the merely animal stage, and before reason was developed in him, the things that were in accordance with his nature were such as health, strength, good bodily condition, soundness of all the senses, beauty, swiftness. In short, all the qualities that went to make up richness of physical life, and that contributed to the vital harmony. These were called the first things in accordance with nature. Their opposites were all contrary to nature, such as sickness, weakness, mutilation. Under the first things in accordance with nature came also congenial advantages of soul such as quickness of intelligence, natural ability, industry, application, memory, and the like. It was a question whether pleasure was to be included among the number. Some members of the school evidently thought that it might be, but the orthodox opinion was that pleasure was a sort of aftergrowth and that the direct pursuit of it was deleterious to the organism. The aftergrowths of virtue were joy, cheerfulness, and the like. These were the gambolings of the spirit like the frolicsomeness of an animal in the full flush of its vitality, or like the blooming of a plant. For one and the same power manifested itself in all ranks of nature, only at each stage on a higher level. To the vegetative powers of the plant the animal added sense and impulse. It was in accordance, therefore, with the nature of an animal to obey the impulses of sense, but to sense and impulse man superadded reason, so that when he became conscious of himself as a rational being, it was in accordance with his nature to let all his impulses be shaped by this new and master hand. Virtue was therefore preeminently in accordance with nature. What then, we must now ask, is the relation of reason to impulse as conceived by the Stoics? Is reason simply the guiding, and impulse the motive power? Seneca protests against this view when impulse is identified with passion. One of his grounds for doing so is that reason would be put on a level with passion, if the two were equally necessary for action. But the question is begged by the use of the word passion, which was defined by the Stoics as an excessive impulse. Is it possible, then, even on Stoic principles, for reason to work without something different from itself to help it? Or must we say that reason is itself a principle of action? Here Plutarch comes to our aid, who tells us on the authority of Chrysippus in his work on law that impulse is the reason of man commanding him to act. 
and similarly that repulsion is prohibitive reason. This renders the Stoic position unmistakable, and we must accommodate our minds to it in spite of its difficulties. Just as we have seen already that reason is not something radically different from sense, so now it appears that reason is not different from impulse, but itself the perfected form of impulse. Whenever impulse is not identical with reason, at least in a rational being, it is not truly impulse, but passion. The Stoics, it will be observed, were evolutionists in their psychology, but like many evolutionists at the present day, they did not believe in the origin of mind out of matter. In all living things there existed already what they called seminal reasons, which accounted for the intelligence displayed by plants as well as by animals. As there were four cardinal virtues, so there were four primary passions. These were delight, grief, desire, and fear. All of them were excited by the presence or the prospect of fancied good or ill. What prompted desire by its prospect caused delight by its presence, and what prompted fear by its prospect caused grief by its presence. Thus two of the primary passions had to do with good, and two with evil. All were furies which infested the life of fools, rendering it bitter and grievous to them, and it was the business of philosophy to fight against them. Nor was this strife a hopeless one, since the passions were not grounded in nature but were due to false opinion. They originated in voluntary judgments and owed their birth to a lack of mental sobriety. If men wished to live the span of life that was allotted to them in quietness and peace, they must by all means keep clear of the passions. The four primary passions having been formulated, it became necessary to justify the division by arranging the specific forms of feeling under these four heads. In this task, the Stoics displayed a subtlety which is of more interest to the lexicographer than to the student of philosophy. They laid great stress on the derivation of words as affording a clue to their meaning, and as their etymology was bound by no principles, their ingenuity was free to indulge in the wildest freaks of fancy. Though all passions stood self-condemned, there were nevertheless certain eupathies or happy affections which would be experienced by the ideally good and wise man. These were not perturbations of the soul, but rather constancies. They were not opposed to reason, but were rather part of reason. Though the sage would never be transported with delight, he would still feel an abiding joy in the presence of the true and only good. He would never indeed be agitated by desire, but still he would be animated by wish, for that was directed only to the good. And though he would never feel fear, still he would be actuated in danger by a proper caution. There was therefore something rational corresponding to three out of four primary passions. Against delight was to be set joy. Against grief there was nothing to be set, for that arose from the presence of ill which would rather never attach to the sage. Grief was the irrational conviction that one ought to afflict oneself where there was no occasion for it. The ideal of the Stoics was the unclouded serenity of Socrates, of whom Xantippe declared that he had always the same face, whether on leaving the house in the morning or on returning to it at night. As the motley crowd of passions followed the banners of their four leaders, so specific forms of feeling sanctioned by reason were severally assigned to the three eupathies. Things were divided by Zeno into good, bad, and indifferent. To good belonged virtue and what partook of virtue. To bad, vice, and what partook of vice. All other things were indifferent. To the third class then belonged such things as life and death, health and sickness, pleasure and pain, beauty and ugliness, strength and weakness, honor and dishonor, wealth and poverty, victory and defeat, nobility and baseness of birth. Good was defined as that which benefits. To confer benefit was no less essential to good than to impart warmth was to heat. If one asked him what to benefit lay, one received the reply that it lay in producing an act or state in accordance with virtue, and similarly it was laid down that to hurt lay in producing an act or state in accordance with vice. The indifference of things other than virtue and vice was apparent from the definition of good which made it essentially beneficial. 
such things as health and wealth might be beneficial or not according to circumstances they were therefore no more good than bad again nothing could be really good of which the good or ill depended on the use made of it but this was the case with things like health and wealth the true and only good then was identical with what the greeks called the beautiful and what we call the right to say that a thing was right was to say that it was good and conversely to say that it was good was to say that it was right this absolute identity between the good and the right and on the other hand between the bad and wrong was the head and front of the stoic ethics the right contained in itself all that was necessary for the happy life the wrong was the only evil and made men miserable whether they knew it or not as virtue was itself the end it was of course choice worthy in and for itself apart from hope or fear with regard to its consequences moreover as being the highest good it could admit of no increase from the addition of things indifferent it did not even admit of increase from the prolongation of its own existence for the question was not one of quantity but of quality virtue for an eternity was no more virtue and therefore no more good than virtue for a moment even so one circle was no more round than another whatever you might choose to make its diameter nor would it detract from the perfection of a circle if it were to be obliterated immediately in the same dust in which it had been drawn to say that the good of men lay in virtue was another way of saying that it lay in reason since virtue was the perfection of reason as reason was the only thing whereby nature had distinguished man from other creatures to live the rational life was to follow nature nature was at once the law of god and the law for man for by the nature of anything was meant not that which we actually find it to be but that which in the eternal fitness of things it was obviously intended to become to be happy then was to be virtuous to be virtuous was to be rational to be rational was to follow nature, and to follow nature was to obey God. Virtue imparted to life that even flow in which Zeno declared happiness to consist. This was attained when one's own genius was in harmony with the will that disposed of all things. Virtue having been purified from all the dross of the emotions, came out as something purely intellectual, so that the Stoics agreed with the Socratic conception that virtue is knowledge. They also took on from Plato the four cardinal virtues of wisdom, temperance, courage, and justice, and defined them as so many branches of knowledge. Against these were set four cardinal vices of folly, intemperance, cowardice, and injustice. Under both the virtues and vices there was an elaborate classification of specific qualities, but notwithstanding the care with which the Stoics divided and subdivided the virtues, Virtue, according to their doctrine, was all the time one and indivisible, for virtue was simply reason, and reason, if it were there, must control every department of conduct alike. He who has one virtue has all, was a paradox with which the Greek thought was already familiar. But Chrysippus went beyond this, declaring that he who displayed one virtue did thereby display all. Neither was the man perfect who did not possess all the virtues nor was the act perfect which did not involve them all. Where the virtues differed from one another was merely in the order in which they put things. Each was primarily itself, secondarily all the rest. Wisdom had to determine what was right to do, but this involved the other virtues. Temperance had to impart stability to the impulses, but how could the term temperate be applied to a man who deserted his post through cowardice or who failed to return a deposit through avarice which is a form of injustice or yet to one who misconducted affairs through rashness which falls under folly courage had to face dangers and difficulties but it was not courage unless its cause were just indeed one of the ways in which courage was defined was a virtue fighting on behalf of justice similarly justice put first the assigning to each man his due but in the act of doing so had to bring in the other virtues. In short, it was the business of the man of virtue to know and to do what ought to be done, for what ought to be done implied wisdom in choice, courage in endurance, justice in assignment, and temperance in abiding by one's conviction. One virtue never acted by itself, but always on the advice of a committee. 
The adverse to this paradox, he who has one vice has all vices, was a conclusion which the Stoics did not shrink from drawing. One might lose part of one's Corinthian ware, and still retain the rest, but to lose one virtue, if virtue could be lost, would be to lose all along with it. We have now encountered the first paradox of Stoicism, and can discern its origin in the identification of virtue with pure reason. In getting forth the novelties in Zeno's teaching, Cicero mentions that, while his predecessors had recognized virtues due to nature and habit, he made all dependent upon reason. A natural consequence of this was the reassertion of the position which Plato held or wished to hold, namely, that virtue can be taught. But the part played by nature in virtue cannot be ignored. It was not in the power of Zeno to alter facts. All he could do was to legislate as to names, and this he did vigorously. Nothing was to be called virtue which was not of the nature of reason and knowledge, but still it had to be admitted that nature supplied the starting points for the four cardinal virtues, for the discovery of one's impulses, for right endurances, and harmonious distributions. From things good and bad we now turn to things indifferent. Hitherto the Stoic doctrine has been stern and uncompromising. We have now to look at it under a different aspect, and to see how it tried to conciliate common sense. By things indifferent were meant such as did not necessarily contribute to virtue, for instance health, wealth, strength, and honor. It is possible to have all these and not be virtuous. It is possible also to be virtuous without them. But we have now to learn that though these things are neither good nor evil, and are therefore not matter for choice or avoidance, they are far from being indifferent in the sense of arousing neither impulse nor repulsion. There are things indeed that are indifferent in the latter sense, such as whether you put out your finger this way or that, whether you stoop to pick up a straw or not, whether the number of hairs on your head be odd or even. But things of this sort are exceptional. The bulk of things other than virtue and vice do arouse in us either impulse or repulsion. Let it be understood, then, that there are two senses of the word indifferent. One, neither good nor bad. Two, neither awaking impulse nor repulsion. Among things indifferent in the former sense, some were in accordance with nature, some were contrary to nature, and some were neither one nor the other. Health, strengths, and soundness of the senses were in accordance with nature. Sickness, weakness, and mutilation were contrary to nature, but such things as the fallibility of the soul and the vulnerability of the body were neither in accordance with nature nor yet contrary to nature, but just nature. All things that were in accordance with nature had value, and all things that were contrary to nature had what we must call disvalue. In the highest sense, indeed, of the term value, namely that of absolute value or worth, things indifferent did not possess any value at all. But still there might be assigned to them what Antipater expressed by the terms selective value, or what he expressed by its barbarous privative, a disselective disvalue. If a thing possessed a selective value, you took that thing rather than its contrary, supposing that circumstances allowed, for instance, health rather than sickness, wealth rather than poverty, life rather than death. Hence such things were called takeable, and their contraries untakeable. Things that possessed a high degree of value were called preferred. Those that possessed a high degree of disvalue were called rejected such as possessed no considerable degree of either were neither preferred nor rejected. Zeno, with whom these names originated, justified their use about things really indifferent, on the ground that at court preferment could not be bestowed upon the king himself, but only on his ministers. Things preferred and rejected might belong to mind, body, or estate. Among things preferred in the case of the mind were natural ability, art, moral progress, and the like while their contraries were rejected. In the case of the body, life, health, strength, good condition, completeness, and beauty were preferred, while death, sickness, weakness, ill condition, mutilation, and ugliness were rejected. Among things external to soul and body, wealth, reputation, and nobility were preferred, while poverty, ill repute, and baseness of birth were rejected. 
In this way all mundane and marketable goods, after having been solemnly refused admittance by the Stoics at the front door, were smuggled in at a kind of tradesman's entrance, under the name of things indifferent. We must now see how they had, as it were, two moral codes, one for the sage and the other for the world in general. The sage alone could act rightly, but other people might perform the proprieties. Any one might honor his parents, but the sage alone did it as the outcome of wisdom, because he alone possessed the art of life, the peculiar work of which was to do everything that was done as the result of the best disposition. All the acts of the sage were perfect proprieties, which were called rightnesses. All acts of all other men were sins or wrongnesses. At their best they could only be intermediate proprieties. The term propriety, then, is a generic one, but, as often happens, the generic term got determined in use to a specific meaning, so that intermediate acts are commonly spoken of as proprieties in opposition to rightnesses. Instances of rightnesses are displaying wisdom and dealing justly. Instances of proprieties or intermediate acts are marrying, going on an embassy, and dialectic. The word duty is often employed to translate the Greek term which we are rendering by propriety. Any translation is no more than a choice of evils, since we have no real equivalent for the term. It was applicable not merely to human conduct, but also to the acting of the lower animals, and even to the growth of plants. Now, apart from a craze of generalization, we should hardly think of the stern daughter of the voice of God in connection with an amoeba corresponding successfully to stimulus. Yet the creature in its inchoate way is exhibiting a dim analogy to duty. The term in question was first used by Zeno, and was explained by him, in accordance with its etymology, to mean what it came to one to do, so that, as far as this goes, becomingness would be the most appropriate translation. 